Okay, so we are going to get started and we're supposed to be starting at 145 and it's almost two, so we're definitely on time. Um, I wanted to say good afternoon, friends. Welcome to the Gulf Coast Connections Conference. Uh, my name is Laura McKinney. I am an associate professor of sociology here at Tulane University. I am also the director of environmental studies and the director of urban studies. Um, thank you all for coming out today. This has been absolutely a wonderful experience so far. Just really quick a note on format. So each of the panelists will individually come up when it is their time to present. And then at the end, we'll ask everyone to come on stage so that we can have a collective conversation. Okay. And Weston, up for you. Thank you. So hello, yes, I'm Weston Twardowski. I am the program manager of the Delubial Houston Initiative at Rice University, and I work in our Center for Environmental Studies. And we are thrilled that you are here. Uh, this is the third of a series of these conferences. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, and for those of you who were, I'm sorry, but this is the third of a series of these conferences that we've been holding annually uh, over the last couple of years as really just an opportunity to meet and exchange and introduce ourselves and our work to each other, uh, really thinking about relationships across Houston and New Orleans in particular, but around the Gulf Coast broadly. Broadly. And so we're just really delighted to be here and thank you so much to Laura and Rebecca and everyone at the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South for all of your organizational work and going along with us on this journey and putting this wonderful event for us all together. So we're just very appreciative and delighted to be uh, in my hometown and here in New Orleans with all of you. So with all of that said, we're gonna jump into a conversation around that if I could talk, uh, environmental media and stories storytelling, really thinking across disciplines, across practices and backgrounds, how we're telling these stories, how people are working through these different issues around the Gulf, and some of the challenges that we're facing and some of the things that we're finding a lot of excitement and energy in these places that we're exploring together. Um, so with all of that said, I'm going to first go over to CNAN and Jaden Bray Boyce, who are uh, my two fantastic research interns uh, on a radio program we run called Gulf Streams. Uh, Jaden Bray Boyce is a Rice undergraduate student majoring in history and religion. Sienna Yen is a Rice undergraduate student majoring in civil and environmental engineering. Both are INST minors, so our environmental studies program minor. Um, and since September have been the research interns for Gulf Streams, which is a program we produce with KPFT Houston uh, through our Center for Environmental Studies. And together they have put together over 23 episode, hour long episodes of heavily researched content featuring different topics and ideas ranging from environmental justice in Houston to the history of meat production. So Jaden and Sienna, I am delighted to welcome you up. Please come join us. Hi everyone, my name is Jaden Bray Boyce and this is Sienna Yin. Um, and we are really excited to have the opportunity to present some of our work on our internship with all of you. But first and foremost, we want to say thank you very much for inviting us to speak about this. Um, all of the presentations yesterday were really incredible and we're looking forward to what today has to offer. All right, so the core of what we do is we begin each week by researching various environmental topics that we're working on. So we gather sources from books, from scientific papers and news articles and reports as well. And after we gather that information, we have to synthesize the, this research and we generate questions for the episode. So the questions are really what guide um, the flow of the conversation and what direction that we want the episode to go. Um, we've also been fortunate enough to conduct interviews with various individuals across many different fields, which has been just an incredible opportunity. It allowed us to speak with people we likely wouldn't have spoken to otherwise. I know I talked to a few people from the Texas Parks and Wildlife, and I know Sienna spoke with a few landscape architects. Um, but also we advocate for the environment. So every week we put together how to get involved segments. Um, essentially finding really interesting volunteering opportunities in the Houston-Galveston area. And the aim of this is to promote um, civic engagement and environmental stewardship. So one of the things that I was able to dive into with this internship was a mini series on wildfires, which was really incredible. I was able to speak with um, Glenn Powell from the Texas Park and Wildlife. I'm from the Northeast, so wildfires isn't something that I really knew a whole lot about growing up because it's not an environmental issue we struggled with. 
So whenever we came down here for school and we started to learn about prescribed burns, I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. Like, what are they doing to the environment? But from a historical aspect, this has been something that's been happening on American soil for many millennia. And it's so important for our fire, our native species, um, getting rid of certain invasive species, and then also just reproducing new growth in these forests. So that was really great to talk about. And for people who listen to the podcast who aren't necessarily from Texas or a place where prescribed burns happen often, I think it's useful. I was also able to speak with the Consul General of the Republic of Cyprus to get a global perspective on wildfires, which was really great. And we dove into the economic implications of that, such as how much money it costs to rent equipment, because for such a small country, they don't have enough uh, resources readily available, but also to see how different countries work with each other. I know um, when wildfires were happening in Greece and Cyprus, Cyprus would go to Greece, Greece would go to Cyprus, Italy would get involved, Israel would get involved. So it's really incredible to learn about the interconnectedness of our globe whenever natural disasters occur. And then also a few weeks ago, Dr. Trudowski and I worked on a meat industry segment, which was super incredible. Um, it's been a topic I wanted to learn more about for a long time. Unfortunately, quickly I learned that ignorance is bliss because this was a very difficult topic to get through. Um, but through this, we were able to learn um, the historical approach from cattle farming from way back when to now and how policies have been influenced through this, as well as the animal and human aspects and the implications of health hazards on the pig farming and the people and the people just living around these areas. And so it was really great. We were able to interview Joshua Specht, who wrote Red Meat Republic, and Alex Blanchett and Mindy Schneider, one who wrote Porkopolis, and one did a few articles on factory farming in China. Yeah, and some of the project, projects that I was interested in working on had to do with urban planning and walkability in Houston. And so I created around a series of four segments on this last semester. And so my first segment was really on this idea of what is a 15 minute neighborhood? Why is this beneficial for people? And a 15 minute neighborhood is essentially where your home is 15 minutes away from where you get groceries, from where you can go to the park and or where you can seek medical care. So this idea is really important and interesting to me. So for my second segment, I wanted to bring that idea into Houston. So I had found out about the plant in Second Ward by Concept Neighborhood, and this is a development east of downtown Houston called Edo, and they were working on around a 10-year project on bringing this idea into Houston where they were gonna create a mile-long corridor of small businesses, residential areas, and restaurants that can bring this walkability into Houston, which is a place that is known for its car-centric culture and also its urban sprawl. And so that got me thinking more about how can we design for people and not cars? And so I came across Indigo by Maristem Communities, and this is a 800 residential community in Fort Bend County, right outside of Houston. And so they were thinking about bringing urban walkability into um, a suburb. So when we typically think of suburbs, you're driving 10 minutes to go to a restaurant or to a grocery store. So I was able to talk with them, produce a segment on this, and they brought up some very interesting points about designing for people. So for example, they talked about how they would line the streets with more trees, not just for shade, but also for creating a visible friction for cars to go slower, and that makes it safer for people um, since cars are going slower. And overall, this was the segment that I was really interested in, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some challenges that we've encountered. So some of the main challenges that we focused on were getting in contact with people, and first and foremost, that was quite challenging, whether that was having people respond to us or show up to interviews after we emailed them countless times and set up times to meet. Um, so that was kind of challenging, but also finding the right balance. So for me, we did an episode, or we all did an episode on carbon capture, and I had never even heard of it before we started. And so finding out how much information we should put into the segment was a little bit challenging as it's a podcast. We can't see who's listening. We don't know what their areas of expertise are, what they know, what they don't know. And so finding just the right balance between enough information, not enough information. And that kind of goes to the sources that we were looking at. There are sources that are very basic, that give us very basic information, which is good to start with, but we want to also find 
a variety uh, of sources that we can look at, not just news articles, but also reports or scientific articles. And that was a little bit of a challenge sometimes. And I would say our biggest challenge was had to do with interviews. So Jaden and I were very new to this starting out. And in our first joint interview with um, Dr. Trudowski, we were a bit nervous. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, we weren't really sure about keeping the flow of the conversation naturally or when to jump in with questions that we had because we knew like for a podcast that this is a conversation that you're creating. It is not just an interview, but I think that's an aspect that we have improved on a lot. So that kind of goes into some more areas of growth that we've had. And so one area, obviously, is we just had increased environmental awareness of these issues because each week we are learning a lot about these different topics, such as urban heat islands in Houston or Houston parks funding and the need for more green space in Houston. And we've also improved a lot in curating and researching uh, for these episodes in terms of creating questions that are effective and yeah. Adaptability is another one we've really grown with. Um, it's something we do in our everyday life, things change, you adapt to it great. But when you have a timeline for something and you are really waiting for an interview to happen and it didn't happen on time or you didn't get enough information and you still need to make sure everything gets done before a certain time, I think we've gotten a lot better at making sure we can adapt to those kinds of challenges. Um, and then also translating ideas. I think from the very beginning, we needed a lot of guidance from Dr. Chardowski on what we were supposed to research and how to do. And I think now we're able to do this a lot more efficiently, um, which is really great. And so then just stay on the lookout for upcoming segments. In the upcoming weeks, you'll see an episode with Dr. Chorowski and I doing an episode with Joshua Specht on the Red Meat Republic, and then one with Alex Blanchett and Mindy Schneider on Porkopolis and factory farming in China. Yeah, so I have a segment upcoming on green stormwater infrastructure and civic engagement in Houston. And I'm currently in the works with Dr. Trubowski on an episode on vertical indoor farming in downtown Houston. And so you can find this podcast and radio show on Apple Podcasts and also Spotify. So if you guys want to check it out, you can just easily look that up. But yeah, thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm the managing producer of Sea Change, which is a podcast from WWNO, New Orleans Public Radio. We launched almost exactly a year ago. Um, we had 22 episodes last year and a mix of interview-based shows and narrative-based narrative episodes. Um, so we are about to launch season two, and we're kind of uh, that's coming up a little too um, quickly for me to be that comfortable about it. But we uh, are our first, um, we are launching season two with a special three part series, and it will come out on March 19th. And um, so, what I first wanted to talk about is, um, and just to give you a little bit of background about, about the kinds of episodes we do, actually, Weston and, um, and Jaden and Sienna, we, we cover a lot of the same same issues, environmental and climate issues impacting our coast. Um, so we have kind of a geographic home on the Gulf Coast, but we also try and connect the dots and work with reporters on other coasts to kind of show these issues are, they may look a little bit different in Maine or in Alaska or in North Carolina, but there's so many of these issues that we are all facing living on our coast now. Um, so last year we started with a episode about the state of the shrimp industry. Um, we talked to musicians about how they use their music to communicate about these very complicated issues. Um, we did a two-part investigation into an EPA, um, an EPA investigation about air pollution in what, we, what is known as Cancer Alley. So kind of the gamut. Um, and what we have coming up um, is a a uh, series called All Gassed Up, so that will be what we launch uh, season two with, and we've been working on it for a while. My co-host, Hallie Parker, who's also a reporter for the Coastal Desk, um, and I came to this that we, that we wanted to work on an episode about LNG, which is liquefied natural gas. Um, we were talking last summer about how this expansion was happening across Texas and Louisiana's coastlines mainly um, of these massive export terminals. 
we started talking about it and we were like, oh, we got to do an episode about this. And Hallie started recording and we were like, this is so big. Like this is bigger than one episode for sure. This is at least now we're realizing like we should do like, you know, spend the rest of our life reporting on this and do like a million episodes. But we're doing, we settled on three, three episodes. Um, so we, uh, we put together a grant proposal for the Pulitzer Center. We ended up getting the grant. And so for the series, um, the first episode that I'm going to play a clip, uh, clip for you all of is, um, first one is based in Louisiana. Second one, we go to Germany. And third is from Japan. Um, so this is kind of first example of how do you take these huge complicated issues we're all trying to figure out how to communicate stories about and, and break them down. Um, so just to give you all a taste, this is, you're the only ones besides our editors who have, have heard this. And this is, um, it's not really the color, but this just kind of tells you what the series is about. If you've been listening to Sea Change for a while, you know Carlisle and I live in New Orleans. We've been reporting on major industries all along the coast for years, but recently we started to hear more and more about the next big industry. It was LNG. For the last year, we've been crisscrossing the state trying to uncover what this growing LNG industry means for Louisiana. But after talking with everyone, from shrimpers to energy insiders, we realized that the stakes are way bigger. If we really wanted to tell the whole story, we had to travel even farther. In this three-part series, we follow the journey of American gas around the world to find out if LNG is the miracle fuel it's claimed to be. If it really can prevent a climate apocalypse. Or is it a carbon bomb waiting to go off? Today, we start at home in Louisiana with a guy in a trailer who's pissed. Okay, so that's a sneak peek at uh, episode one. And um, so I was thinking about what, I've, what I was gonna talk about and what Weston and I chatted about last week, which, which was thinking about the common problems that we're all facing as environmental storytellers. And what I came to, um, and Weston actually, you and uh, Jaden and Sienna, helped me come to my first point I wanted to make, which is that all of, there's not a simple environmental story out there. These are all complicated, hairy, big issues that we're trying to figure out ourselves what's going on and then take, all, as, as you all, um, uh, Sienna and Jaden just talked about, do all the research and synthesize it and then not only synthesize it, figure out how to communicate it in a way that people don't want to turn you off and you don't go into climate grief and you don't, you know, like all of these things we're trying to juggle. Um, so the first point I wanted to make, um, or first, I guess, tip that I learned along the way and then Weston reminded me of um, in a recent carbon capture episode, was don't forget to ask the simple questions. Um, you are launching into this complicated carbon capture issue, and as I'm listening and you're talking to experts and they're like off to the races, you know, they're like know everything there is to know about carbon capture. And they start talking about injection wells and da da da, da and you kind of, it's a hard, it's a hard skill to get to. Um, but you were like very politely interjected at the right moment, and you were like, "Okay, what's an injection well?" You know, and it's like remembering to ask those questions to kind of get a baseline of knowledge for for whoever's watching what you're doing or listening or reading is um, is kind of get the basics. And for me. A mistake I made when I first got into audio is I would do so much research before an interview that all of a sudden I knew all the ins and outs and then I would be in the interview and then I'm like try, not trying to show off but I'm like forgetting to ask. I'm like oh yeah I know what they're talking about so I'm now going to ask this next question and then you go to edit and you're like I never got them to say the thing like the basic thing. So ask the simple questions. Um, so the, um, the second uh, tip was, um, is to simplify. So thinking about these very complicated issues that we're all trying to tell stories about, um, finding out after you do a lot of, you know, do your research, you want to do this story, you know it's a good story, take a moment, whether it's talking to your friends, talking to your editors, talking to um, other classmates, whoever, whoever it is, 
Tell them about the story. Let them help you get to your focus. You know, as you're going, you're kind of like, oh, maybe they hear something that you don't hear. Oh, you seem to be really interested in this one part of it. What is the focus of the story? The story is not the issue. You have to find the story. What is the narrative? Um, and then through talking, and sometimes this takes a really long time, what is getting to what is the driving question? And I write it at the top of every Google Doc I have, the millions of Google Docs I now have going. What is the driving question of this? And I, as I'm going, I keep looking back because I put it in huge whatever point font across the top to make sure that I'm staying. I keep coming back to that. And then who are the best characters to help me tell that? Um, and sometimes that takes, sometimes it's the only person you can find. Sometimes like that is the scientist who's doing the thing and maybe they're not the best talker, but like that's what you got. But sometimes it takes more, it takes knocking on people's doors, it takes talking to 10 different people to figure out who can really help bring this story to life. Um, so simplifying stories is sometimes easier uh, to do than others. There's some stories, like there was a story I wanted to do last year about one of the most endangered sea turtles on the planet, the Kemp's Ridley. They're also adorable and the smallest. Um, and they are only left in the Gulf of Mexico. So I was reading about this turtle and I was like, God, this is amazing. They just found them for the first time in 75 years on these on the Chandelier Islands, which are these like far flung islands um, off the Louisiana coast. And it's amazing. It's this hopeful story. What we're trying to do in Sea Change is like find some hope amongst all the other things we're doing. Um, but I was like, okay, and then they're also working on uh, restoration of the chandeliers. Oh, that's fascinating. Coastal restoration, what's happening to that? Turtles, beaches are so important. That's, you know, most sea turtles, as you probably know, return to the beach where they were born to have their own babies. How is beach restoration gonna impact turtles? Like, what is the future of coastal restoration and the future of beaches? Oh, if I wanna talk about turtles, I gotta talk about beaches and beach nourishment. And you can see, like, I'm spinning out of control. <laughs> and I had this uh, brainstorm session with people and everybody was like, yes, yes, you should do this interrelated story about the future of turtles, the future of beaches, all this stuff. And so my, I almost, I was laughing with Rebecca. I looked at my first Google doc of this brainstorm and I was gonna bring it to show, but then I was too embarrassed because it looks like a crazy person. Um, so that is okay if that's what step one looks like, finding your story. And I eventually got busy with other things. It's still, I stand by that still would have been a good story. But anyway, it was too much for the time. And I simplified and I was like, okay, I'm going to go with the scientist to look for the turtle. And then I'm going to talk to the turtle lady expert, Donna Shaver, who um, lives on Padre Island in um, Texas. And it was, you know, it was a good app. It was not all the different things, but you can speak to some of the things without exhausting yourself and your brain and all your resources. So simplify. Um, and then um, the third thing I wanted to talk about is um, with these complicated stories, how, what I think about a lot is like maybe Hallie or another reporter will come to me with their reporting. Um, they want to do an episode about something. And maybe it's a great piece for NPR or for that style, but it's like, how can we take that and make it more sea change? How can we make it more of a narrative? How can we bring in some other storytelling devices into this, like suspense, like um, more character building? Um, so um, I look for I, what I kind of think of as access points. Is there something that, I, is there some sort of hook I can use to get into this great reporting that maybe maybe it's about kind of a very sciencey thing and I want this podcast to be for anybody living on the coast or anybody interested in these issues and to feel like they're they, this show's meant for them too it's meant for everybody um, so she um, this is an example I'm going to play um, Hallie had been doing this really great reporting about the saltwater intrusion um, issues and as you all probably remember there was a saltwater wedge coming up the Mississippi River. It was um, impacting, you know, Plaquemines Parish drinking water. They didn't have access to drinking water for months and months. She had this great reporting. And then it was also thinking about how do we connect this across regions? Certainly saltwater intrusion is impacting other coastal areas, what's happening there. 
Um, so I found this reporter from North Carolina who'd done some reporting about um, how saltwater intrusion was impacting agriculture. So um, bringing it together, I was like, okay, these two great reporters with this great reporting, how do I get somebody listening to an episode about saltwater, saltwater intrusion? And this is what I came up with. We're at the bar with Gregory at Commander's Palace, and today I'm going to make you the salt wedge. Commander's Palace, arguably New Orleans' most famous restaurant. It's been around since the 1880s. The jazz brunch was invented here, and now a new invention, the salt wedge cocktail. It's going to be a 1.5 ounces of Milagro Reposado tequila, 0.75 ounces of Apple Roll. In New Orleans, we've learned to take natural disasters in stride, or at least with a drink. We've got the hurricane, and now, the salt wedge. Give it a shake. Now we'll take the lime, put the back of it in salt. Add that to the drink. And that gives you the little wedge. Gregory hands me the drink. It's orange, with a salty wedge of lime on the rim, poking fun at our latest environmental threat this thing called a saltwater wedge that caused a lot of problems earlier this year. Yeah, you. I mean, if you have one or two of these salt wedges, then uh, you're not as worried about it anymore, you know? So that's, um, that's another lesson of also paying attention to what's going on in your community. I had read about how they had come up with this cocktail, which is so New Orleans, and also was like, makes you kind of feel cozy and comfy in there. You're just hanging out at the bar. You don't know I'm about to just like slam you with a bunch of science about saltwater intrusion. You're just kind of like having a cocktail. So like finding those hooks to get people in into the stories. Um, and then, do you have time for one more example? One more? Okay. Um, the final, final one. So this is something I think about a lot. This is uh, another way I did this with another episode, um, this NPR investigations reporter named Kiara Eisner had been um, reporting about Rice's whales, um, which I thought was also appropriate for the uh, Rice University here. So she'd been doing all of this uh, uh, reporting last year and her months of work got boiled down into like seven minutes for NPR and it's a great story. But she also, she reached out because she was like, I've got so much tape, I've got all of this reporting and what can I do with it? Can, and I was like, oh, this is great. This is totally up sea changes alley. Let's figure something out. She didn't have time to do anything. She was like, here's my seven minutes. I was like, okay, I can build something. Also, I was working on this LNG thing and I was like, oh God, I gotta put out a show. So um, so I, she had gave me all her raw tape and I found these little moments in there that she had, didn't have time for in the NPR piece. And I heard these fishermen who were telling the story um, and I was like, oh, okay, there's a story that we can attach to all this great reporting. So um, this is what I did with that. Ben said it was a normal day fishing at first. When we are out here fishing, we turn the motors off and pull up to a um, patch of seaweed looking for mahi or looking for any other game fish that hang out in that area. So Dwayne was peering into the distance for any kind of fish action when he saw something unusual. Maybe 200 yards away, I saw water fly up in there, and I thought, well, a big fish just landed there, and the water flew up. But then Dwayne saw something surface, something bigger than a fish. I didn't know what the creature was at first. But they kept watching. And then I see the whale roll, and I noticed a small dorsal fin. Now, I wasn't aware of any whales in the Gulf. I had no idea there were whales out here. They are a pretty rare sight in the Gulf of Mexico. But it turns out there are many species of whales that either live in the Gulf or migrate through its waters. But it wasn't just any whale Ben and Duane saw that day fishing. It was a whale that scientists only just discovered, and already one of the world's most endangered. It was a rice's whale. We kept watching it. But the whale kept moving, and then, of course, I suggested that we start up the boat and move over closer because we might catch some fish off of it. But just as quick as the whale came, that loud motor scared it off. Almost immediately, the elusive Rice's whale was gone. So, big mistake. 
I'm Carlisle Calhoun, and you're listening to Sea Change. Okay, so that's what I did with that. And so it's simplifying, finding the access points, finding interesting ways to get into these really complicated stories, and asking the simple questions too. So thank you all. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here and bearing through this afternoon. Um, so I am a multimedia storyteller who wears many hats. Um, and I'm based in New Orleans um, and came down here actually to do what was supposed to be a one-year project about post-Katrina rebuilding. And here I am 18 years, 19 years later. Um, that's what this city does to you. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit today about the role of narrative um, in social justice organizing. And I just, a few months ago, finished working on a project. I was directing a project called Rise Home Stories that um, actually ended up being a six year long project that um, was funded by the Ford Foundation. And they, we brought together um, activists, organizers, policy folks, um, who were working on land, housing, and racial justice across the US. And we put them in a cohort together with multimedia artists, journalists, and storytellers also from all over the country to do two things. One was to figure out how understanding the role of narrative in storytelling can actually support all facets of social justice work. So not just communications, not just media work, but policy, legal, um, on the ground organizing, um, and then also to create uh, a beautiful body of work. So we actually, over the course of several years, produced um, a children's book, um, an animated series, which I'm gonna show you the trailer for, uh, a podcast, um, an interactive website, and a video game. And they all went on to win awards and reach audiences all over the world. And what was interesting about this experiment was that the so-called storytellers and the advocates were co-creating all these projects. And the sort of operating theory was that we are all storytellers. It is the basic unit of human cognition. It is how we make sense of the world. It is how knowledge is transmitted. It is how we communicate with other people. And so this idea that sort of storytellers and artists are in a silo over here and folks who do organizing work and policy work and legal work are over here, we were really trying to sort of bust through that. And, and through um, creative co-creation, building power together. So um, I'm going to show you a trailer for the animated series called Mine, uh, which is about a near future post-apocalyptic utopian community that is powered by a sacred water source. And that water source gets compromised. And this um, utopia has to sort of wrestle with um, some demons that they thought that they had left behind. It all started with the water. The world as we knew it was gone, consumed by flood, followed by drought. But then the water spoke to us and gave us a second chance. The water allowed us to build a new community from the ground up. We called it Bovoda, beautiful water. Some say our water is sentient. Some say our water is magical. Uh, before you two go, can you check my hydro generator? It seems broken. I'll, I'll take a look. I hope that our newest recruit is up to the monumental task of protecting this precious resource for future generations. It's not the machinery. It's the water. Nonsense. The water is infallible. I can. 
can fix this. You are not fixing anything alone. Why would you even give me this job if you don't trust me? Um, series and all the sort of body of work that we created, we started before we even thought about creating anything. We spent a year um, building a shared narrative analysis. And the question, we asked pretty simple questions, but pretty profound questions um, around all the work that we were doing, which is, what is our irresistible vision for the future? Because a lot of the issues that we're grappling with right now, um, there's a crisis of imagination around. It is very hard for people who are struggling for survival to be able to have the space and time and in many ways luxury to think about a beautiful future. But that's exactly what is required to move any social justice work forward. So we really thought about what is the collective future that we're all fighting for many generations down the line? And how we, can we articulate that in a way that is just irresistible to people? How do we invite people into that? And then thinking about what are actually the harmful narratives that are standing in our way. Um, so then we defined for the purposes of our work together, um, we use these definitions and these things are referred to differently depending on what you're talking about. But we call the source narrative, which is often known as paradigm, deep story, um, structures of knowing, just different ways it's referred to. But source narrative being the widely and deeply internalized core belief that you have from the moment you draw breath about how the world works or how it ought to work. Because often narrative and story are conflated, right? So we were trying to sort of draw the distinction between this sort of the root deep stories that we carry around often on an unconscious level, and then the story level, which is the individual expression of those source narratives, which is informed by your lived experience. So your day-to-day -day lived experience is data that you're gathering all day long to support the source narratives that, you're, that you are deeply embedded and ingrained. So we really thought about like how can we harness these two levels, and especially on the story level, which is the conscious level of how we all communicate with each other, how can we think of seeding and growing and nurturing alternative visionary narratives to really um, challenge and reframe the harmful narratives that we've all inherited. Um, and I've most recently been doing work as a narrative consultant, which is sort of a funder invented term, with organizations and foundations that are doing environmental justice work. So most recently I was working with the JPB Foundation that had a cohort of grantees working in environmental justice. And again, um, across many disciplines. So journalists, artists, policy folks, um, direct organizers. And so as part of that work, I interviewed everyone to really get a sense of what are the harmful narratives that they're up against, that they're feeling like need to be transformed for the environmental justice agenda that these folks are fighting for to actually happen. So I was gonna share some of the results of that research. So top harmful narratives, and I'm sure you all have encountered these in the work that you do. Scarcity, domination, and consumption as the primary ways that we as human beings exist on this planet. Our relationship to the earth is predicated on these three very harmful um, ways of being. Inevitability and doomerism, the fact that a lot of people feel that this is an intractable problem 
that is above and beyond them. There is no solution. It's inevitable. And there's just not much to do. White supremacy. And we'll talk more about this. But the role of white supremacy in environmental justice or in hindering environmental justice is something that until recently has not been discussed with sort of the rigor and fervor that it, it needs to be discussed as it is now. Um, the idea that frontline communities, the folks who are most impacted by climate crisis are either victims without agency or irresponsible contributors, irresponsible stewards of land who are contributing to the problems. Technocratic solutions being the most viable. Solutions that are complex, out of reach, require a kind of level of skill and knowledge that is not accessible and that that is what we all need to be putting, investing our time, energy, hopes, beliefs in. The false binary of environmental justice versus economic growth and job creation. That's something that across the board, no matter what community folks were in, they were saying is this constant struggle where they are always pitted against job creators. Um, and then the demonization of government, which um, even the most progressive um, radical groups often fall into. Um, thinking of government as, again, a hindrance, a contributor to the problem, and rather than looking at, at, at it as actually one of the few entities that can drive solutions at scale, especially in a democratic government that theoretically is supposed to be representing the folks who, the communities who, who put our elected officials there. And so these top harmful narratives are amplified because uh, narrative is amplified by policy, by legal um, structures and mechanisms, by entertainment, by media, by all of it. But of course, these harmful narratives are absolutely amplified by the fossil fuel, energy, agriculture, industries, and allied politicians, right? So it's, it's this, none of this is an accident. This is all very intentional. And so the visionary narratives that folks are really interested in trying to sort of figure out how to get out there is this thinking about a beautiful tomorrow. It's not only possible, it's viable, and it consists of a series of important elements. Thinking about collective interdependence, moving past the toxic individualism that, and, and sort of meritocracy narratives that are so part and parcel of the American um, legacy and experience. Thinking about how our human presence has to be sustainable and community-centered. Revolutionizing stewardship of land, water, air, food, and energy. Collective action centering frontline and BIPOC communities. And again, this is sort of in line with the sort of countering the, tech, the purely technocratic solutions. This idea of honoring BIPOC knowledge and expertise, ancestral knowledge, different ways of relating to and stewarding land, water, air, agriculture, understanding that these communities have that ancestral knowledge that can actually be deployed at scale. And then the idea of a regenerative economy. Again, this, this sort of moving past this false binary of economic growth, economic drivers, and environmental justice. So one of the most important parts of this sort of narrative work that we've been doing is around the question of audience. So a lot of nonprofits and organizing groups still sort of have a, a little bit of an old approach to audience, which is this idea of sort of a general public or a mainstream audience that folks have to reach, which usually can be interpreted as white, straight, affluent. Um, you know, there's still sometimes this idea that the gold standard is to like get an op-ed in the New York Times, um, no matter if your stakeholders and your, <laughs> your communities and your constituents actually read the New York Times. Um, so this, these questions are, are ones that we really encourage folks to tackle so that they can get really clear on who they're trying to reach and who they're trying to move. So who are you trying to reach, why? 
What do you want them to think, feel, and do? So it's not just about awareness, education, engagement, emotional catharsis. What do you want people to actually do beyond signing a petition or clicking on something? And then how will you reach them? So, you know, this idea that there are different modalities, different genres, and they're all really important at reaching specific audiences. So that's why in this particular project that we did, Rise Home Stories, that's why we had a children's book, a podcast, a video game, an animated series, because it was designed in the aggregate to reach a pretty large audience. And thankfully, actually, a lot of these groups did ident identify that frontline and impacted communities are actually their most important audience that they are trying to move their people to tackle this crisis at scale. Grassroots advocates and organizers, values-aligned allies, values-aligned policymakers, and values-aligned private sector. But, but in a hierarchy of importance, the priority really being their folks and their communities. Um, they did identify a lot of barriers to audience engagement, which included lack of accessibility, overwhelming volume of media and messaging, just the sort of constant competition for eyeballs and ears, white supremacy and racism, people not seeing themselves or their lived experience or their perspectives represented in mainstream media and then a lack of resources. So it takes money and time to create media, often. Um, and so really thinking about, and, and a certain level of technical skills, so how does one make that more accessible? So what we arrived at in this, in this project was really thinking about centering co-creation and power sharing. So thinking about the act of creative collaboration as a way to build power together. When you are creating a book or a podcast or a film or whatever it is, you're world building. It's what, what's, it's called world building in Hollywood for a reason. You are actually imagining how the world will work. Um, for the animated series, we had to think about systems of governance. We had to think about what were the roles in the community? What roles did the elders play? What role did the young people play? Um, what did the houses look like? What, what, what was the infrastructure? Like, so every aspect of that is an opportunity to really think about the values and principles and elements of this future that we are all trying to build together. Centering the voices and perspectives of BIPOC and frontline communities in front of and behind the camera. So not just dropping into a community and um, viewing folks as subjects for interviews or you know, compelling entry points, but actually working with them to understand all the nuances and complexities of the particular issue and, and working with them and collaborating with them. And then finally, we really learned that this cohort model was, was pretty amazing. Having folks as fellow travelers for a period of time going really deep um, into these questions yielded a lot of um, amazing sort of cooperation and synergy that extended far beyond the sort of structure that we had created. And these are folks that are now working with each other across geographies. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of what we uncovered in this research. Um, and I'm gonna leave you with this one quote that um, from Rashad Robinson, Director of Color of Change. Narrative infrastructure is singularly about equipping a tight network of people organizing on the ground and working with various sectors to develop strategic and powerful narratives. And then, against the odds of the imbalanced resources stacked against us, immerse priority audiences in these narratives to enduringly change hearts, minds, behaviors, and systems. Um, thank you, it's great uh, to be with you all, and thank you all for coming out. Um, and I'm thrilled uh, to be able to present 
Aiden and his work uh, to you today. But first, I wanted to shout out some great environmental science, uh, environmental studies students that have come today. Thank you. It's very valuable to have your presence. And Lucy Jane, who's writing, who's reporting on this whole uh, conference um, for the alumni magazine, I believe. School of Liberal Arts magazine, yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, th I thought it would be valuable. I mean, one thing um, in speaking with students who are interested uh, in these themes and in, and in writing about them and in writing journalism, um, I think it can be extremely daunting to figure out how to get started um, and what opportunities to pursue um, and how to go about doing it, especially, um, you know, as a, as a few previous speakers have said, these are very complex uh, issues, not just scientifically, but often morally, um, politically, and um, I think it can feel especially daunting um, as a young person to figure out, well, how do I find my own way into this? Um, and how can I speak with any authority about these subjects that um, tend to, we assume, are the domain of um, you know, scholars, um, experts, and, and, and so on. Um, so Aiden um, here, though, has, I think, to a remarkable degree, figured out a way in um, in just in the, just the last year or so. And I thought before we get to the journalism that he's already done, um, I wondered if you would begin by just explaining your path here because it's an unusual one, um, but I think an instructive one as well. Yeah, I just uh, want to start with saying I'm happy to be here. Um, Professor Rich didn't say I needed to prepare anything, so we're kind of winging it today. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I came to Tulane as a pre-med. Um, I mean, my parents are both healthcare workers. Um, was a student athlete here for a little bit. And I mean, I always had medical school um, in the back of my mind. and. Everyone knows, you know, medical school, economics, finance, it's all very straight line. And I think um, journalism is the opposite of that. Um, you kind of have to find your way. And so I'm beginning that process right now and it's been really interesting. Um, I first met Professor Rich last year or last semester. Um, I didn't know it was an environmental journalism class. Um, I've always liked the outdoors, but I'm not, you know, I'm not in the crowd that's, um, I guess, the environmental studies crowd, or I wasn't initially. Um, and after taking Professor Rich's environmental journalism and then this semester environmental humanities, um, I've just gotten more and more interested in it and uh, more and more interested in journalism. So um, yeah, and I'd like to share a little bit about some of my article. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it possible to pull up the Cleveland piece in the hollow board? I can, yeah. I can go find it. You want to go look for it? Um, I'll go look for it while I kind of pause. So, so the first piece I wanted to um, have, let me see, what screen? This screen. Um, ask Aiden to talk about it. You know, actually last night, I didn't mention this, I went to a, um, a benefit, I guess, or a preview for this film that's being made by a local documentary uh, filmmaker named Catherine Cecil about the Claiborne well, it's not exactly about the Claiborne overpass directly, but it's about um, Claiborne and this historical value, cultural value uh, of Claiborne Avenue um, at, in the Treme, um, about an extraordinarily rich um, history of black commerce, music. Um, last night it was at the Jazz Museum with a focus on the um, rich jazz history um, in the neighborhood, um, which was uh, deeply challenged or destroyed uh, to some extent in, I'll do this after I stop talking, um, when um, the decision was made to run the freeway right through the neighborhood. Um, so first of all, Aiden, why don't you explain the background, of the historical background in brief of the story and, and uh, why you were drawn to writing about it. Yeah, so um, the Tremaine neighborhood um, is widely considered the oldest black neighborhood in America by a lot of historians. Um, starting in the early 1800s, it became a place for the black community. Um, 
I guess I wouldn't say escape, escape segregation, but they had their own community. Um, they had their own coffee shops, um, their own restaurants. Um, you know, the oldest grocery store in New Orleans is in the Treme um, community. Um, and so I'd heard a little bit about the overpass, this overpass that's uh, nicknamed the monster that destroyed the Treme community. Um, and so I just kind of researched a little, a little bit. Um, and then the historian that worked on that documentary, Reynard Sanders, was, I guess, my first in to the story of Claiborne um, in the Treme community. And so I guess I reached out to him. Um, and then I want to emphasize the point, um, I guess, of showing up um, instead of emailing, because New Orleans is a place where not a lot of people respond to emails. So um, I guess I want to emphasize about the, the importance of you know, driving around the Treme community. Um, my best interview was with Charbonnet Funeral Services. Um, and again, I just knocked on his door. And a lot of these people are very, um, you know, they want to talk. They want to talk about this issue about Treme. So, um, and maybe you could talk about how. I mean, I thought it was interesting the way in which it it took on a kind of uh, environmental themes, even though know, that's not necessarily where you started. Um, there was uh, it used to be a tree line promenade. Um, and uh, a, a meeting place, and when the freeway came in, um, it became a site that was often associated with heavy pollution. Um, and uh, but then also, I think the most interesting part about the story um, is the struggle within the community about what what to do next. Um, there's a controversy over whether or not the freeway now should be taken down. Uh, the Biden administration had started to take preliminary steps to do so. Um, maybe you can explain the two schools of thought um, about within the community about what, what should happen next. Yeah, so that issue is definitely still going on. Um, I guess one school of thought um, is to keep this overpass up because Treme is a community that um, has experienced a lot of, I guess, gentrification and people are worried I guess, you know, there's going to be a lot of outside funding and they, they're not going to have any control over that. Um, you know, city council, um, or the city actually proposed plans to the Biden administration, how they would spend that money. And a lot of that planning was not done with any, you know, the, the input of the community members, which has been, you know, a source of strife in the Tremaine community. Um, and then there's some other, you know, schools of thought there's one plan to put a marketplace under the overpass, but it's like, who wants to go to a marketplace under an overpass, like a farmer's market under an overpass? Um, and a huge issue with that overpass, I don't know if anyone's driven by it. Um, there's a lot of homeless encampments there, and um, there's a lot of illicit activities that go under some of the, go on under some of those ramps. So some people in that community would just be happy taking down the ramps. Um, but I guess long story short, people want at least something done and nothing's been done so far. And um, I guess I forgot to mention this overpass was constructed in 1969, so this has been an issue um, for a while. Um, and then uh, another uh, intractable, uh, seemingly intractable issue um, with broad ramifications here is, is the general, the, the many interconnected failures of the Sewage and Water Board, mm -hmm. um, and I guess more broadly drainage and pumping in New Orleans. Um, can you explain the work that you are doing with the Lens, which is a fantastic local um, journalistic organization here, um, uh, the work you're doing with Katie Rechtal there, and um, how you came to do that work and how you came to take on such a big story and all, and yeah. all of that. Yeah, and actually, I mean, I was doing an internship at the Lens, but it actually started with your class. Um, he told us to write, you know, an environmental article about the city. Um, and I, I was, you know, taking notes on city council for the Lens, but I wasn't really doing much. I wasn't actually writing anything. So I, I found this as an a good opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. Um, I guess try to write something meaningful and, you know, get our final paper, paper done <laughs> in the same 
um, in the same project. Um, what was your question? Uh, just how you how you came to the the lens and how that. Um... Yeah, I guess I, I reached out to Katie Recto, who's a great editor here in the city over the summer. Um, and I didn't really know much about our city's water problems. This is not something that I was, you know, directly affected with. So I didn't really know what I was getting into. I didn't know how big of an issue this was um, for New Orleans. Um, so I came across an article in The Guardian that gave me the initial idea. Um, New Orleans has like some of the most unaffordable water bills in the country. Um, and then another article mentioned half of our city's water actually leaks before it even reaches most people's faucets. And I thought those two would be connected. Um, so it turns out we're paying half the water we pay for um, to get treated. We don't actually receive. Um, so that was, I guess, the initial end. And there's so many rabbit holes you can go down with this. It was hard to, um, I guess, keep my focus narrow, which is, I guess, is something most journalists struggle with, that I'm, I guess, starting to find out. Um, yeah, and then another issue, you know, New Orleans has some of the most unaffordable water bills, but we also have no really relief assistance. So we have one agency in the city of New Orleans um, responsible for helping people with water bills, TCA. Um, Thelma French is the CEO and she's a great interview. Um, but they're they're underfunded and you know they're kind of they're kind of underwater and um, yeah people who go to TCA have to choose between their energy bills being helped with their energy bills and being helped with their water bills they can't have both because they're just not enough money um, so yeah Great. I'm told we're out of time do we end it there do we have a chance for one more would you briefly explain the the story that you're now reporting. Yeah. So this is another one that stemmed from Professor Rich's class. Um, I was tasked with writing some essay about a place in New Orleans, you know, a nature, um, something natural in New Orleans. And I picked Bear Terrier Preserve, which I had been to a few times. Um, it's like 30 minutes from New Orleans. Um, I really just like seeing the alligators. <laughs> um, but I didn't realize, you know, that that park is really struggling. This is like a national park 30 minutes from New Orleans that, you know, not a lot of Tulane students really know about. Um, and ever since Hurricane Ida, about half their trails have been closed. Um, and so I'm just beginning that process, um, talking to, you know, some biologists that work there. Um, but I guess this is, this is in the frame, you know, in, against the backdrop of the larger uh, Louisiana coastal master plan. Um, which is, you can explain it better, but it's like the biggest. Yeah, I think that, I think it's safe to say it's the largest climate change infrastructure project in the world that's now, just in the last week, um, under threat perhaps of, um, of either being abandoned or um, transformed. Um, but I don't want to take time away from a, a broader discussion, so um, happy to see the floor to the next uh, discussion. I think it's just, I just wanted to, uh, one thing I think about being even story that I just wanted to highlight is that, it, you know, this kind of work, and this is something Carl talked about as well, requires a lot of creativity and um, a sort of a hustle, hustle element and an ability to kind of shift uh, depending on the opportunities um, available and the stories that present themselves. Um, and so I think it's that kind of uh, thinking on one's feet goes against a lot of the, kind of the advice that students as undergrads tend to get, which where the focus tends to be on really plotting out a plan, a multi-year plan, going to graduate school, going into a profession. Um, there's a kind of um, catch catch can quality to it. I think this kind of work that uh, can be hard to embrace, but, but also is necessary in order to, to find the stories that um, are worth telling. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of commonalities that ran across this conversation, um, especially thinking through audiences. Something that I will say that immediately kind of focused on in my attention is that attention to local stories. Um, and that I think, you know, across these media, folks are, oh, actually I can't.
I'm gonna stay over here. All right, so uh, attention to local stories in really thinking about, and I'm curious, maybe even starting with the undergraduates, I'm gonna put you on the spot, um, but I'm really intrigued by <laughs> endless stories of you know, difficulty around local news media, right? Endless stories about how hard producing local coverage has gotten, and this is not purely journalism. Uh, we are thinking across a range of media and structures of storytelling, but what it means to connect with local groups, to actually bring them into these conversations, to hold those conversations together and with them, and how we dig into that uh, in a, at a time and a moment that it's really difficult. And I, I say I want to start with the undergrads because I think in particular, and I, I don't know, Aiden, for you, but uh, for the others, you know, I know you're not usually, undergrads are often not from where they're at, right? And so I think it's something, I think it's a tall order that we've asked of all three of you to suddenly learn a place and to try to connect to it in ways. And so I'd love to hear from you about how you think about the place you're in and the work you're doing before we move into a broader conversation around some of the practices that our, uh, our seasoned professionals are, are deploying. Um, I think you have to be probably over-informed about your issue before you try to interview someone. Um, I tried to interview the sewage and water board director and like off the bat, I was like, I'll learn from him right away. Um, and my editor was like, no, you have to do like a few weeks of research before you reach out and ended up being a good interview, but it would have been horrible um, if I had just tried to do that off the bat. Um, I think it also really depends on a topic that you're really passionate about helps. Um, again, I am from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so I'm pretty lucky in terms of we don't really have any natural disasters um, or like transportation issues. And then I've learned a lot from Sienna actually with her presentations on urban transit. I mean, we're now in Houston and I don't have a car, thank goodness, at school because it is a mess. Um, so learning about that through Sienna, through our courses together and like through this internship, has been really great. I think it's just allowed us to explore topics that we wouldn't normally do um, from where we're from. Yeah, and so I'm from Atlanta. So we, Jade and I both came from different states to go to college. And when I was in Houston, I did really, Rice is around a relatively walkable area, which we are lucky for, but yeah, Jade and I both don't own cars. So we see a lot of these issues that comes up with the Houston Metro or the bus lines near us. And that got me kind of thinking about um, walkability and urban planning in Houston. And I noticed, especially at Rice, so I was talking about trees earlier and Rice is, is a campus that has so many trees. And I think that is a wonderful aspect, helps with the heat as well, and also safety factors. So that kind of got me thinking about my uh, ideas for urban planning. Uh, Chris, I, I'm going to let this go to the audience at this point. Uh, hi, everybody. Again, we're here today. A lot of fun. This is a really wonderful uh, panel. I was really impressed by everyone's work. And as somebody who does a lot of tech, I was really struck uh, by everyone's use of like visual and or um, auditory media. Uh, what do you think is so specific about these forms of media? Uh, did the really play a big role in the way that you tell your stories? Uh, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on that, what people touched on it, if you elaborate, that would be really wonderful. Sort of like the method. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've actually, I, I'm, I work in kind of all sorts of media, including text, audio, and visual. And I, and I do think, I'm, I really am a firm believer that the story dictates kind of what the medium or genre should be or format should be. Um, and I think often in sort of social justice or impact-driven media, the question of really, who's your audience? What is accessible to them? What, where do they get their information? Where do they interact with story? Is that social media? Is that church? Is that the grocery store? Is it local ethnic journalism? Like, I, you know, I think there's that, that sort of question of um, really doing the research and sort of understanding who you're trying to reach and what is the optimal way to reach them, um, which 
you know, it is a little bit of a departure from the sort of one size fits all kind of, um, at least kind of training that I got many, many years ago, which was like, you know, you have an idea, you know what format it is and who it's gonna get out to the world and you hope to reach as many people as possible. Um, and I do think, you know, there is also the sort of accessibility from a resource equation. I mean, obviously uh, audio is, is cheaper than, than video um, or audio and stills, right? So. I think it just really depends on the sort of resource equation and how accessible that is to, um, you know, depending on if it's community media, if it's, um, and I think also audio is just, you know, so much more prevalent now and, um, and wonderful. I really enjoy it and find it very liberating, but um, yeah. Yeah, and actually Louisa and I were chatting about this. I would say, um, and I've also worked in all the different things, um, I would say the difference, a big difference in audio from text is the way you, you may structure a story similarly, but there's a lot more latitude with when you're reading something, people, you can absorb a lot more information when you're reading. You can kind of be a little more subtle with your storytelling as a writer. The, re the reader, maybe they've got to go back, but you can, you can put a lot of numbers in there. You can kind of um, just flow with the story a little more subtly and kind of let the narrative unfold. And something I had to learn, and I think anybody who has, has not done a ton of audio as they start, is that you really have to tell people what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them, and then you're like, remember what I just told you. And so you kind of have to keep giving people, we call it signposting. Um, but these little moments where you're telling people, you know, hey, this is important. <laughs> pay attention, stop like, you know, folding your clothes for a second or whatever else you're doing. And, and this is, listen to this point. So it's like, it's really hard for writers sometimes to like write in that very basic, you know, like I'm working with a writer right now and I'm kind of having to say, this is so beautifully written, but also like, it's a little too smart for my ears. Like you're telling me so much in this little area. We have to pick one thing. We have to describe, use, one of these four great words that you just use here. Um, so I would say that is a difference. And then perhaps another difference would be what voices you end up using. Um, sometimes the best interviews for a print piece because they are like just so informed and giving you all the information you want, you want your expert to do, you know, but you, for audio, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you can't, I can't listen to that for so long, you know? And so you find those voices that really speak to you and maybe it's, you can bring such emotion through audio. It's really intimate. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why so many of us love podcasts is like, you feel like you're there with the person. Um, so I think it probably changes, you know, who ends up being in your story sometimes. Um, I, yeah, I don't know if I'm really um, have much to say on this subject. I'm a writer. Um, that's my only my only um, form. Um, the closest version to that kind of calculation that I have in my writing is um, whether to write uh, in fiction or nonfiction. I write novels and I write narrative journalism. Um, and what I found. You know, and, and in both forms, what's, what, what I'm most interested in um, are stories that help us try to grapple with um, what our knowledge or understanding of this new, uh, this transformation that's, that's ongoing now of civilization, um, to, to put it as generally as possible. Um, what is it doing to us personally? You know, what is it, how is it changing the way we imagine ourselves, our role in our democracies, in a society, um, down to the most intimate questions uh, in our personal lives. Do we have children? Should we have children? How do we, how should we direct our energies? Um, and, uh, you know, what do we make of, uh, you know, what is the knowledge of, you know, for instance, to give one example, you know, the fact that we're this is the warmest year in history and it's the coldest year of the rest of our lives. You know, what do we do with that information? How does that filter into our most intimate decisions? And, um, you know, I think the, the value of um, 
And, and sort of the great uh, advantage of writing a, a narrative in particular is um, it allows you uh, a, it allows you deep intimacy with the reader and allows the reader um, through empathy to enter the story um, and to enter the lives of the characters um, living the story that you're trying to tell. Um, and so it, uh, but what I found is that with environmental issues, there are some stories um, that are better suited to fiction and nonfiction. And in fact, it's maybe perhaps some, somewhat counterintuitive that the most um, sort of shocking environmental stories are often best told uh, through nonfiction. Because if you're, if you're to, to fictionalize it, um, you, you have to, you, you risk losing uh, the reader's belief. So sometimes when I, I come across extraordinarily dramatic stories that seem sort of like too, too, you know, like the expression stranger than fiction, you know, I find that actually those should not be in fiction, right? That in fiction, it actually could be more easily discounted as a kind of fantastical story. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the most dramatic case of, version of that for me was a, when I learned about what would happen to New York City if a hurricane hit. And I, I um, wrote a novel called Odds Against Tomorrow about it that was very much based in the facts uh, and, and sort of a deep uh, reading of the, of the literature of the, the kind of um, technical government predictions of what would happen if there was a flood, uh, a hurricane hit at a certain angle. And by the time I published the book, about 10 years ago, um, just before the publication, Hurricane Sandy hit New York and it actually like fulfilled a lot of the same, you know, it, it matched what happened in the novel because the novel was itself based on these government reports. Um, and but that was a case where, uh, you know, before the novel, I, I was worried that it would be taken as a fantasy. Um, and then when, after the storm was taken as a kind of documentary uh, element, but th that's a kind of balance that I find um, depends on the, the, the subject matter and, and um, yeah, often the more shocking things, the more naturally they're suited to non nonfiction and, and journalism. I think we're at time. So was there one? No? Okay. All right. I think we're at time. So I, we should keep going on schedule. Thank you so much. <laughs>